Okay, welcome everyone to our session today. And what we're going to do first is introduce ourselves. So I'll let our panelists first introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Travis MacArthur, and I was the former residential coordinator, now the admissions coordinator for the Berkshire Center. I was the residential coordinator at the Brevard Center and at the Berkshire Center uh, since 2008. <laughs> Hi, and I'm Margaret Dillon Katz, and I was used to do the admissions director and then um, transition coordinator as students left uh, college internship program CIP, and now I work with our all our presentations in terms of conferences and things like this evening. So I'm the presentation coordinator. And this is our founder, Dr. Well, that's it, but I like to describe my softer side, so I am the dad of six children and 12 grandchildren, almost 13, and I'm an artist and a gardener and a traveler and a painter and whatever, but I also am diagnosed on the spectrum, so um, I guess I'm not going to be Asperger's anymore after May, I'll be ASD instead of Asperger's on the DSM-5. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to keep it nice and easy here. And by having three panelists, you're going to get three different um, concepts put forward here. And we're going to talk about executive functioning in different ways and all different aspects of it, both residentially, academically, and um, in other, in, you know, employment, all areas of the student's life. So, we're going to let Mark get start here with our first slide. So first I want to ask you as an audience, how have any of you ever had a morning where you got up, you woke up late because the alarm didn't go off or you kept pushing it off, and then you didn't have time, you didn't have time to uh, eat your breakfast, and then as you ran out the door you couldn't find your keys for your car, and the day went on like that. Has anyone ever had a morning like that? Yeah, and what's that like? Not fun, right? The whole day is just thrown off, really difficult. And executive functioning has a lot to do with, one of the functionings of executive functioning is your sense of time and planning ahead and being organized. Those are, say, three different executive functions. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take you through what it is kind of quickly, and then we're going to go with um, where the challenges are. So how many of you have a really good sense of what executive functioning is? Good, so pretty strong. Um, but we will definitely cover it, and then we'll cover the challenges, and we're also going to do some activities. We're going to look a little bit at your own executive functioning, which I hope will take your understanding a little deeper. <coughs> so what I want you to do here first, this is called the Stroop Test. Can you all hear me OK? Yes. OK. So this is the Stroop Test, and it was used for different psychological tests. But in more recent years, it's been used as a tool. Um, it's not an end-all test for executive functioning, but it's used as a tool to help see if maybe someone has some challenges in this area. So the instructions for all of you, I'm going to have you stand up. Stand up so you can get your blood going. And when I say go, I'm going to have you read as fast as you can. So don't try to stay together. Just go as fast as you can through, through the whole line from right on. Everybody ready? Yeah. Yes, across, just like you would read a book. Read it like you'd read a book. Everybody, yes, out loud. Out loud, as fast as you can. Ready, set, go. Red, green, blue, yellow, pink, orange, green, green, white, red, yellow, blue, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. Good job. Uh, 
uh, doesn't really matter. The main thing is read the color that you perceive it, or say the color you perceive. And when we say go, everybody all at once go as fast as you can. One, two, three, go. Green, Green yellow, yellow, white, purple, red. Blue, yellow, red. Blue, red. Yellow, red. Blue,
getting there, but you know, we can be really tough on each other. So that's one of the things to not beat each other up. Okay. So what executive functioning does to help the student, helps them uh, pay attention, control impulsivity by inhibiting an inappropriate or ill-time responses, transition from one task or an activity to another, and manage their time. It also helps the student to engage in mental planning, working memory, planning ahead, uh, persist to complete a task or activity to the end, Organize and keep track of one's belongings and actions. Self-regulate and exhibit self-control. And self-monitor monitor one's behavior. Executive functions are cognitive, cognitive activi activities of logic, strategy, planning, problem solving, information processing, and behavioral control. Executive functioning difficulties can lead to uh, difficulty predicting what will happen next, which can which creates anxiety and transition problems for our students, especially uh, inflex inflexibility, uh, getting stuck, uh, needing to pre preserve sameness, routine, difficulty attending and concentrating, the impulsivity, blurting out in class or on a bus or in, in school. Uh, difficulty with working memory, so that it is available when needed. Executive function difficulties can lead to difficulty managing and allocating time, especially with respect to long-term assignments and planning. So planning those assignments out, uh, steps ahead, when's the rough draft going to be due, when's the final copy due. Uh, difficulty keeping track of belongings, material, forgetting things, uh, doing a, a great job on a on the take home test or a paper, forgetting to bring the memory card to, to the school or print it out to bring it to school. Uh, difficulty multi step or complex tasks, uh, disorganization in the room and in, in the book bag, and, uh, difficulty working in groups, and difficulty with planning. Okay. We're going to act ahead and look a little bit at your own executive functioning. And again, this is not an official test, but it's one way to look at your own um, skill set. So what I'm going to do is give you each one of these. It's a set of um, two pieces of paper backsided. And the instructions are um, to fill out, you'll rate each of the areas on a zero to three. So just look at it, rate it. But before you start it, I'll remind you when I hand this out. Just look, scan the two, the two pages back to back and estimate how long do you think it'll take you to fill it out. So this is a, an exercise also in how long trying to estimate time. So everybody got that? Is it clear? Okay, good. If you finish ahead of others, just take one in and pass it to If you finish ahead of everyone, you can go to the last page, which is called Time Estimation Sheet. This one's really fun. It says things like, how, how long does it take you in the morning, say, to get ready for work? Like, how much time do you need to allow for, like, a shower, those kind of things? <laughs> okay, that was a little over four minutes. Did it feel like four minutes? No, it felt longer. It felt longer? I know, it felt longer than me, too, actually. Yeah. All right, what you're going to do um, is one of the, pick one that you had a higher score, meaning like a three or a two. Pick one that you want to get better at. And that's one of the um, activities that you would honestly like to get better at. And then very quickly, yes? Yeah? I have one. Okay, but you can just, don't tell us yet. Okay. okay. Just for yourself. And then write, Next to it or on the back page, one strategy that you use or could use to improve. So do that really quickly because then we're going to have you partner with someone and do like another one minute exercise. <coughs> so do a strategy, write out a strategy to get better at that one thing that, that you have a high score on. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. All right. We have to stop. You can, you can partner up after if you want to finish your conversation. My recommendation is if you're really serious about getting better at this one activity, 
is um, if, if we do something for 30 days, you practice the new strategy for 30 days, we're more likely to keep doing it. And even better is if you have a buddy that you keep accountable to each other, so you kind of say, how are you doing with that? You're more likely to follow through. So it's of course up to you if you want to do that, but I strongly recommend try practicing a new strategy for the next 30 days and try to have a buddy who holds you accountable in a kind way. Um, did anyone find a couple to buddy up to partner? Did you get some new strategies? Yeah? Yeah, what did you want to say? You know, I have a tendency to make things more complicated than they need to be. So it's just, you know, making the lists and stuff. Oh, okay. Good. And the other thing you can do is you can get a cough counter and put it on your wrist and you wrist and you can sort of click it when you're when you're doing a new behavior. You make a goal of ten clicks a day or something. And then the other thing you can do is just write it on some initials on your back of your wrist with maybe the initials of what you're trying to learn and implement. And you know, it washes off after a, a week or whatever. Or you can just keep writing over it and <laughs> use it for a month if you want. But you could uh, just put initials there for what you want to remember to do and start implementing it. I did this one time when I was trying to learn to say hello to people in the morning. I just put a golf counter on and I clicked it every time I said hello to someone. And it was to improve my own social behavior. Okay, we're going to move on to Travis here. And everyone can switch back to the visual C if they want. <laughs> <laughs> So I call this the before picture. This, this is a girl I worked with who no longer is here. And uh, this is a picture I took uh, the first day I started doing residential executive functioning with her. And I'm going to have you, the, the audience, use their working memory to remember this picture because we're going to come back to it uh, at the end. You'll see the after picture. OK, so we're going to go on. So first of all, I'm going to comment on the previous slides and say, um, before you came here today, a lot of you did what I call cognitive executive functioning. So last night, like especially maybe this couple is coming from, how far are you coming from? Where where did you come from? Um, Granville. Granville, so that's a little bit of a haul. So probably last night or even a couple days ago, you said to your husband, you're going with me to this thing <laughs> on Thursday night, right? And you need to be home from work at this time and we're gonna eat here on the way or whatever we're gonna do. And then you had to have someone meet the kid at the door, or whatever the way you had to do it. Someone fed the dog, or didn't feed their dog tonight. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, so she didn't do her executive functioning tonight. But, uh, so you did all that in your brain, and you did it out through osmosis. And a lot of, we take that for granted that we can do that as adults. We're just thinking ahead. You know, I, I do this for a year ahead. Like, I've already planned out my entire January, February, March. April, May, you know, and a lot of the summer. And so I know what I'm doing almost every day and things get out of then, but, um, you know, I'm already thinking about packing because I'm going to Florida in a week. And I'm already picking, you know, how am I going to do that? Where do I have to get my car serviced, you know? So this is a cognitive executive functioning. You don't even have to write a list, you just do it. And then people write lists too, right? And um, so that's one thing I want to mention. And then, uh, there's a lot more to executive functioning, like just for example, self-monitoring. Um, how do you, like Margaret said, by having a, um, a partner is a good way of self-monitoring. It probably doesn't want to be your spouse, because like you said, you, might, you know, if you had to hear the criticism all the time from your spouse, it could be your best friend who would say, listen, Margaret, did you, you know, do this, or you know, today you said you were going to do it. You might accept it from a best friend or another person easier. And that's a good way of monitoring. But also, for example, with a student, let's say there is a football game this Saturday and you won, and you're, you set up your study time for your exam on Monday, and someone comes into your dorm room and says, hey, do you want to watch the football game down at the pub or whatever? And you really want to do it. You have to have a repair strategy. We're going to talk about that later. Built in so that you have to be able to 
be flexible and say, you know, can I do this? Or is this like a class that I'm going to flunk? And maybe your priority goes up to staying there and saying no. But if it's a class that's pretty easy and you can do it like on your schedule, you can do it later and you know you're going to do it later, then maybe you can go to the pub for two hours and watch the game. And so you, that, you have to be able to be flexible in your planning and be able to have a repair strategy if something goes off. Um, the other thing is, um, and self-monitor your own behavior with that, and reward yourself. They set up rewards for yourself. I used to set up rewards for myself, I still do. So I do my hardest work first at work in the morning. I do my calls I don't want to make. I do my reports I don't want to do. And then I allow myself to have a piece of chocolate or something out of my desk or, or take a break or whatever. And I do, that's the way I do it. And it helps get all this, this stuff out of the way first. Um, yeah, and then having strategies, like I said, repair strategies, but also strategies when you're stuck. Like a whole list of things, what can you do when you're stuck? Those of you who work at the centers, you notice those posters we have? What do you do when you're stuck? And it gives you like about 10 things on there. And you can try and then call a friend, uh, start over. You know, if you're stuck, go through the first few steps and start over and review it. You know, if you're doing an outline and read it over, and then the next thought will come to you maybe. So there's a lot of different strategies for when you're when you're stuck. And I also want to mention something that's not on our agenda, but something that has to do with executive functioning for you students, especially if you're doing classes and you're let's say, how many of you are visual learners out there? your hands up, a lot of you. Okay, so visual learners, if I had, had this strategy in college, it would help me a lot. Take a piece of paper like this, do you want to do it for me? And you fold it into 16 boxes. I guess 16, right? Yeah. And what you do is um, you make visual notes. And this system would have really worked with me. I think you only have eight there. I do it one more time. And um, and then it reads across like you would a book, sideways. Okay. We're gonna open it up. And it goes like that, sideways. So. And this, so you fill in these boxes and you just, what you do is you put in just a couple initials or a couple of phrase words and maybe a picture. So if I'm talking about Columbus, you put a little boat there and then maybe a couple of important facts like 1492, and a couple things, then you go on to the next one where he's talking about the Magna Carta, and you maybe make a picture of the Magna Carta, put the date down, and you, this is, helps you visually remember things. People like me, I would pass everything with that kind of a system. And uh, there's a book on this by Oliver West from London. It's called Visual Social, Visual Thinking Strategies. I think Visual Thinking Strategies. And so there's a bunch of those other things with that, but. It's another executive functioning um, thing that you can use. I just want to add too, is as long ago as Mark Twain, he used to, when he did it, he was asked right. to speak all over the country and world. And he, that's how he did his notes. He wouldn't write anything. He would do little, little drawings. And so it would right. remind him quickly of what he wanted to say. So it's a great way to nudge your memory if you're a visual learner. Sure. Now, executive functioning impacts every area of your life, not just academics, or it's about employment, health, fitness, occupation. Like, for example, I had really good executive functioning skills at home. And my, my, my mom trained me really well with keeping my room clean, making my bed, doing organizing my drawers, all of that stuff I can, I can do really simply. The academic executive functioning was very difficult for me. I didn't know how to prioritize my, I didn't know how to make us take a syllabus and plan out my semester where I did, you know, a draft and an outline and, and have uh, due dates for different parts of it. I didn't know how to prioritize. I, everything was had equal value. And even at my work, everything on my desk had equal value until I learned to prioritize and say, this, and now I can make like a pile in my briefcase and say, I'll do this on the plane on the way to Australia. I'll read all of these things that I don't have time to read now. And I'll look over these emails later, and these ones I need to do now, and these things I have to do now, and these things I can do a couple days from now. And then what's most important to do now in prioritizing and scheduling what you're going to do and, and delegating, all these things are all executive functioning skills. 
Yeah. So for occupational, uh, the students who have the executive functioning difficulties, especially now nowadays, em employers are looking for people who can multitask, um, and that's a big, big uh, advantage to getting a job, doing multiple things at once. And that I think that's only going to be more more of a demand in the future. And so our students with the executive function difficulties, um, they really have to learn the strategies before moving on to a career, um, a, career a career path. And so all of this impacts all that. And um, so go to the next slide. Matt's doing his nails here. Um, chances are good that students not lazy or dumb is not oppositional, that they're not doing this on purpose to drive you crazy. And so it says a quote from Stephen, without appropriate support to student with Asperger's or ASD or LD, he may feel that he's drowning in a million different subtests, and he has to have trouble prioritizing and organizing tasks. So I have like big long lists, but I have to star the ones that I need to do right away. And big stars for the ones that are immediate. And then I keep things like this. See, this is my note here. This is my list. But if it's really important, it goes up here. If it's not important, it goes in this uh, pocket. And if it's really, really important, it's written on my hand. And if, and if it's something that I have to remember to do, like a call for a radio station, to, I need to call in. I put 10 minutes before on my timer. So my timer goes off wherever I am. I said, I've got to get back to my office to be on the phone. And so I, because I can't, because I'll go unconscious because I have so many things going on in my life. So I have to do little things like that to help myself. And um, okay, so let's go on. Let's see. Common misperceptions of a student did well on assignment or essay yesterday should be able to do the same quality of work today. That's not true. It depends on what's going on socially, what's going on emotionally with our students, right? If they come back from a break and their mom, you know, was all over them, they were whacked out, they can't really function as easily, they have to get back into the groove, right? Uh, we came back from vacation from Australia, and my spouse can't get into their work again for their masters, it's like off, and it's gonna take them a couple days to get back into it. So you get thrown off by different things. And um, the best way for all students to focus is when they are still and the room is quiet, but that's not true for everyone. Like for me, the best place to study was in the library because there was noise, background noise, but not talking, not at least not real loud talking. And that, that noise kept me awake. If I studied in my room, I'd fall asleep. But if I studied in the library, there was enough noise to keep me awake, but not disrupt me. Uh, another reason why sometimes uh, we aren't able to remember we can do something one day and not the next that sometimes is our working memory failing us. Working memory is being able to access information right now. And so I guess the analogy I would give is a little bit of, it's a sad one, but um, someone with Alzheimer's, you know how one day they can access information and the next day they can't. And it's a little bit that way. It's not that you have Alzheimer's, um, but it's that you're not being able to access the information that your working memory is not coming through. So it's definitely not laziness. It's definitely not being oppositional. But often the person is accused of these things. And so it causes a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and it's important for people to understand that. Um, I was going to say one other thing, too. Yeah. So another example for you would be uh, the cognitive executive functioning is when I came back to the United States from uh, my 26 hours of travel three days ago, uh, what I did, I thought it through, and this is where my Asperger's actually helped me, because I thought it through and said, if I get up a couple days before I return, four hours earlier, like I got up at 5, 4.30, 5 a.m. in Sydney, so that I would be a little closer to the time here, rather than sleeping into 8 o'clock or something, that three or four hours took some of the jet lag off. And then the other thing I did was, I, when I got on the plane, I figured out exactly so many hours after I got on the plane, what time it was here. And it was about 10 or 11 at night, and I took my meds and slept for eight hours. Woke up a couple hours before the plane landed in LA and stayed up those hours and stayed up in LA all the way to 
the time to sleep here again, took my meds again. It made my jet lag, if you did a case study between mine and my spouse's, like, you know, a maniac for three days, and mine, I went right to work. The next day I got back here in the morning, and I was pretty good. The second day was a little harder for some reason, but the first day was not that bad. And I did other things too, but on, on top of that, but I thought it through and made a schedule in my brain, figured out the best way to approach it, and then followed that. And uh, so you can allevi alleviate a lot of problems if you can use a system like that to follow. And on the, on the flip side of that would be a student who stays up all night playing a video game until 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, and that's where the executive uh, functioning difficulties come into play. They're, mm -hmm. they're too tired to get up the next morning, and it's a just continuous trend. They don't realize that they're missing out on all, the, all these classes and things that improve their life just because they can't monitor their sleep habits. Yeah, so what we're saying basically is that the sensory integration part impacts this really, really strongly. Because if you don't have a good sleep diet, if you don't have a good food diet, if you're not exercising in order, so I'll give you an example of how I did it today. I took about three hours this afternoon, because I'm still having jet lag. I sat out in my backyard in the sun for about a half hour on my face with my dogs, my little puppy and everything. Then I went and swam, because I would work this morning and I knew I was going to be working tonight and I don't want to be a workaholic, and I was so like too much for me coming back. So I t took about three hours in the middle of the day to do that so that my sensory things would be in gear so that I could do my executive functioning work better tonight. So this is strategies that you have to do for yourself. We talk to your students. Self-care is really an important part. You can't function if you just ate macaroni and cheese and, and then all you had is cereal in the morning. If you had all carbs all day, your brain is not going to function as well as someone like Margaret who had salad and greens and you know really good antioxidants in her, in her system. Your computer, your biocomputer is going to fail. And so it's what you put in there. If you put water in your gas tank instead of gasoline in your car, how's that going to work? How's it going to function? It's not going to function. So the sensory and the wellness stuff impacts it usually. I have to tell that to a couple people here, and they know that really well. So going on to you, Margaret. <laughs> I have one more point, too, about the idea of the best way for students to focus is by being quiet and still. And I'm still shocked by hearing sometimes people say, I knew he wasn't paying attention because he wasn't looking at me. He wasn't um, sitting still. And some people literally need, um, like dancers, often learn best by moving. That's how they learn. They need to move. Um, so we need to keep that in mind. And another thing is, how many of you have ever had some of your most amazing creative ideas when you're on a walk or you're in the shower? <laughs> yeah, so a lot of times for creativity to occur, they've studied this, it's when you're in a very relaxed, um, moving kind of situation where you're moving, walking, uh, water often elicits it as well. So you, want, you need to be flexible in allowing these different kinds of settings to bring out your best really executive functioning and thinking. I'll just add a little bit to that because it's really important because if you're in a big problem and you have a lot going on, you know, we tell you talk about the donkey rule about getting five other people's opinions before you make a good choice. The other thing you can do is step back from a problem. So when they had the Dalai Lama come to MIT, the professors were saying to the university president, why do you want us to spend a day with the Dalai Lama? We have all this work to do and everything. He said, because I want you to get out of your box with all the projects and research that you're in and look at things a different way. So I recently, when I was in Australia, I took a week because I felt like I was overwhelmed with all my projects and everything in my life. And I went and meditated and did art and sat on cliffs by the water and just quietly ate simply and, and slowed my everything down and a big problem occurred in the middle of my trip and I, instead of reacting immediately with an email back to the person, I took four days and wrote four different drafts and canceled each one of them until I got the one that made sense that wasn't panic driven That was, and I sent that one and resolve most of the problem. So what I'm saying is that sometimes you have to go slower 
to make a better decision, and that takes sensory, takes the executive function to think about that and to settle yourself down, calm your system so you can make a good choice. Not be impulsive. Not be impulsive, which is another part of you know the syndrome anxiety, right? If you calm your anxiety, the way I describe it in my meditation is it's like sitting next to a pond and you look out, this happens to me all the time, and it's like a fog on the pond. And when you calm yourself and don't think about the problems that are going on in your life, all of a sudden that little fog will lift. And I don't know why, but right out of the blue it'll say, you should do this. And some problem I wasn't even thinking about, oh, that would be the perfect solution. It'll just come to me when I calm myself. Do you know how when you're trying to remember someone's name or something and you force yourself? What do you have to do? You walk away from it for a few minutes and you remember it immediately. But if you try to keep thinking on it when your brain is stuck, you don't get it, do you? But when you move away from it and go do something else for a minute, I say, oh yeah, it was, this was it, what it was called. And so that's an important technique. And let's go on with Margaret or we'll never get going. <laughs> okay, um, this next slide is, go ahead, Matt, is about working with students specifically in the college search process, but it really applies for any situation, whether it be in college or a job. And sometimes, as Michael was saying, we can get overwhelmed by all the to-dos. And one needs to just really focus in on a few things that are a priority. And you might need step-by-step um, -step explicit directions. You're gonna do better with specific short directions. And some of us also need it to be in writing to be able to remember it. If you're visual, and not auditory, you're probably going to need to write it down. You're going, to, you're going to be a lot more successful. And again, if you can, Michael has an amazing system of organizing itself. Um, some people aren't able to do it to that extent, so it may be that you start, up, start off with a short list of the most important things so you don't get overwhelmed. Um, again, then it, moving on to um, if a student, say, is writing a paper, or again, if you're in a job, you have a big project, um, you might need to meet for a shorter period of time rather than try to work it out for two or three hours. That just may be too burdensome and you get stuck. So it's better to do short spurts of work. Take a break, go outside, go for a walk, do something pleasurable and come back to it. Um, and some students do really well or some of us do really well. Again, like Michael uses his phone to remind him of what needs to happen. So there's so many great technology gadgets that we can use with our computers and phones for reminders. Um, when we're working with our students, we, we want them to set deadlines, but we want them to set deadlines a little bit early. So if there is a problem, you can ask, they can be empowered to ask for an extension. Um, and of course, we want to save all the work you always do. So sometimes that's part of executive functioning too. Remembering where did you store that document on your computer or what's the system that's going to help you remember where you put it and um, where you saved it, what you named it, all those kinds of things. Uh, and then finally, the other thing is um, brainstorming. Sometimes students get stuck with just like, what am I going to do with this paper or what am I going to do with this project? So brainstorming together, sometimes, sometimes we need someone to do it with us rather than all by ourselves. Um, and you might, again, need to do it in, in different chunks. Uh, for students, you probably found it's better to go back and work with maybe your tutor um, maybe three times rather than do it in your room for three hours. I mean, just it's so much better when you have someone to kind of walk you through. It's still your ideas, but you have that support. Um, and just that we always want to be supportive of each other when you get frustrated, when you get down, both as to each other as students and also as professionals to be supportive. So metacognitive training. I guess we're supposed to be on the next one. Okay. I think we will take that. It's all right to skip that. Okay, so it's knowledge and awareness of one's own thinking and the ability to monitor and regulate the process of that thinking. So, you know, it's an un untrained mind doesn't get anywhere and unless you have a, unless you develop the ability to control your mind and what, and what you're going to go, you're not going to get anywhere. 
So structuring, storing, organizing, retrieving from memory are aspects of metacognition that can be learned. Uh, I had trouble memorizing anything in college. I'd have to make an a a acronym, or um, I'd have to make something that made sense so I could remember the initials, and then I could recall what the words were or the sentences. And um, well, you can't remember what you can't pay attention to. So, for example, when I was in Australia, I met my my future son-in-law's brother's girlfriend. And I wanted to remember her name. And I said, what is your name? I, could, I didn't get your name. And she said, it's Kia. I said, well, how do you spell that? She said, K-I-A. As she said it, I saw big block letters, K-I-A in caps, in black, right up above her head. And that's how I'll remember it forever. But if I do that, something like that, and you know, if anyone read the book Born on the Blue Day, with Daniel Tamman, who's an Aspie guy from England, and he's the one who has syncinesia, which is he had a, some kind of a, a fever when he was young, and he had Asperger's, and with that combination sort of set off his brain into a, um, improved his memory to an extent where what he can do is they had him memorize pi times pi times pi times pi times pi or something and they had three professors with computers and for five hours in a row he took two weeks to memorize it he repeated all the numbers it's like the numbers go on for five hours in a row and did not miss one number for five hours like two three five seven through five no like that for five hours you watch it online just google it and you'll see it and they have it, the video of it, and didn't miss a letter. And, and they asked him how he did that. And he, has, he has a visual memory, and he sees numbers and letters and translucent colors. And then there's a spirogyra that sort of come off it. And so he has, they're like linked. The numbers just come off it in a spiral, and then it goes to the next one. And, they, and he can sort of do lists that we can't do. I can remember like five things, you know, we're all five numbers or something. So it's got that that going, but um, so some of the other things, uh, you know, you can't, if you don't understand it, you can't remember it, so that's why we talk about things, rehearsal helps, and just re repetition, um, it's an active process, so you, the more you manipulate the information, the more you learn about the situation, so let's go on here, and these are techniques, repetition, visual, see it in your mind, and uh, Viskoski, maybe you can say that, Alex Viskoski, how do you say that? I can never say it. Called it a scaffolding, so it's an association. I use this one, I learned it in Dale Carnegie class in 1982 or 83. And what it is, is and it helps me all the time. If I'm like in bed in the middle of the night and I'm anxious and I remember all these things I have to do, Instead of, I, I'm one of these people who I just, even if I have a pad and paper and a pen right there, I, I'm like, I can't get up to do it. So I'm like frozen. So what, what I can do in my brain is make a list. So what I do is, let's say I have to tell Alex about a computer problem. So I'll put a computer there and I might put Alex sitting on top of it. And then if I have to tell Matt about something about a, a PowerPoint, I'll put Matt sitting on Alex's shoulders. And then I want to tell Stephanie about that I'm coming to a date I'm coming to Florida. I might put a calendar on Matt's head with Stephanie and Stephanie sitting on top of it. Or and then it goes on like that. I might put a bicycle on top of something or my car if I have to get it serviced. And then it'll go up like ten or twelve things. And then I just go over it a couple times and I go to sleep peacefully. And when I wake up I remember the whole thing and I write it down if I want to. Otherwise, I usually can remember it most of the day. And then I just go right through the list and do it. So for visual memory, people with visual memories, you can do a technique like that. And let's go on. So another one. It helps students to choose an individual strategy. So you've got a, your goal is to have for your child or your student or for, your, for you as a student, is to have individual strategies in your apartment individual strategies at work, and individual strategies with your academics. And they can be totally different. Like um, Travis is going to talk about different things they do in the apartment to help students organize themselves. 
Some people use color-coded things, some different types of systems. So some might be better for you than others, even if they seem child okay, Visual schedules. It doesn't matter. So these are examples of visual schedules, right? That's actually a color-coded schedule, and then this is a visual, visual one. And we try not to put, do you want to talk about So uh, here at the College Internship Program, our students all have uh, a schedule that's given to them weekly. It, it, it kind of breaks down everything they have to do that week, from, from 8 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. And you can see here, things that are representing gray are, are all our in-house classes, and then we have um, community college classes in orange, and internships in green, and weekend activ activities uh, in, in pink, or right on the side. And then all of the uh, in-house uh, life skills, residential, um, in, in uh, the light blue on the top here. So it really, it, it, it's a good way to transition from one place to another. If you're, if you're in orange, you're at, you're at work. Uh, if you're gray, you're at the building, you're in class with other, other students, or one-on-one -on -one tutoring session, or social thinking. Uh, and then at night, you're transitioning to, back to your apartment. So it's time to start cooking. Uh, and it's just a good way to, a quick glance, and I used to ask students all the time, like, if, if I see someone wandering, like, where are you supposed to be? And they're like, well, I have, I have to do this. I'm like, well, take out your, your schedule and prove it. So they actually keep your schedule. Just a good way to, just something to keep referring back to. Every, pretty much in between classes just to get everything down. So we've talked about this before. Um, you have to have a plan, an execution, and then a repair strategy. So what am I trying to accomplish? What are the necessary steps? What are the sequence of steps? Sequencing is really important. You have to do the outline, then you do the rough draft, then you do you know the editing and like that. And how do I start? You know, some people have difficulty starting, right? This is what I used to do. I used to do everything but the thing I didn't want to do the most. And I would clean my office, I would do everything, and I'd put off that thing I did not want to do. In most cases, that thing was a lot easier than I thought. And I caused myself a lot of stress and stupid time. I'd have a clean office, but, you know, if, if I, I'm better off just to go right at it, and I've learned that over, you know, just try to get some of it done. And then, and then a plan to how do, you, how do you persevere? The difference between people who are successful in business and those who are not is not intelligence, it's perseverance. So when you, how do you have goal, persistent, goal, persistent, perseverance? You know, how do you do that? And how do you keep yourself after a project when it's something that you have to stay with? Like when I was writing my book, it was really difficult because you would get stuck for, I'd get stuck for a week or so at a time. So I finally figured out, and I went to my house in Florida, and I would have quiet space, and I did it in the morning, and I would reinforce, then after that, my, was, my day was free, and I would just do three or four hours in the morning when it's quiet, and you know, and then I'd go out to the beach and stuff in the afternoon and do the stuff I wanted to do. And then that way I got into a pattern and it was quiet in the house. I get more done in an hour there than I could up at work here. So I went down there a few times and I really knocked it out. So you have to have a place and then, and then you have to anticipate what could go wrong and try to build in strategies. Um, and, then, and then repair. Is the plan working? If it's not, shift the plan. Who can you ask for help? How can you restart? What can you do differently so that you get, can concentrate better? If you can't do it in your room, go to the library. If you can't go to the library, then maybe you can go to your parents' apartment in the back of their house that's empty or something. But you have to find places and spaces and time and do it with the environment. Some people like music on when they work, some people don't. Some people need frequent breaks, some people don't want to try to get large chunks done at one time. But you know yourself and you try to work out that plan. And then, um, what can you, and then analyze it afterwards. What can you do differently next time? And so that you don't say, make the same mistakes. Like if you waited too long on your paper, then you won't start earlier the next time. And so we're going to talk about that when we get to it. I guess who's next there? So this is a big one, managing time. So a great way to manage managing your time, and this isn't just for students, it's for, this is for everyone. Uh, segment large tasks into chunks. And that could be everything from that big assignment due at the end of the semester. When, when should I give a rough draft in? When do I need to have the first draft in? So you really need to schedule that, that time out. 
uh, use calendars to, to, uh, to schedule things out as well, uh, day planners to keep track of long-term assignments, uh, due dates and deadlines, so you know what's coming up, review your schedule weekly, so you know what's happening that week, so you're not surprised. Uh, reminders on computers and smartphones, especially uh, all, all our students now have smartphones, I would assume, the majority of them do, and those, those, those reminders are great. Uh, you, you throw something on there and, and it beeps, and you're like, oh yeah, I have to do that today. So that's just an easy thing for anyone to do now. Um, and then organize daily, weekly, and monthly. And, and that, that's a, the same thing. Like this, These are the things I have to accomplish this month, and then this week, and then today. So you really just plan ahead, look, at, look ahead at your, your life, basically. Uh, use checklists and to-do do lists, love those. And then time estimation worksheets. And we, I, I've used this in res the residential setting. In, so I have to get to class at 8 o'clock. So what time, what time do I have to get up to take a shower, make sure I have a healthy breakfast, make sure I have all my homework on my backpack ready. So it takes this long to have to get the backpack ready to, to leave, get my coat on. It takes this long to, to have breakfast and this long to shower. So using those times, you can, you can kind of get that how long things take and actually time yourself doing it. Uh, to be, make sure you're, being, you're ready on time. Because a, a, uh, a lot of our students, especially, just don't know how long things take. I, I, I've asked students before, like, how long do you think a shower takes? I've heard everything from two minutes to an hour. And so it, it is good to, to time yourself, um, to really understand. Uh, I, I ask, like, how long do you think it takes to brush your teeth? What would you guys say? Two or three minutes. Two or three minutes? So you have, you have that down, because you, you do it so often. And what I was, what I was saying before, to-do list, I love that. Um, it's a good way to get the, that memory on a piece of paper when you have it in your brain, and the little check mark, positive reinforcement every time you accomplish a task. And uh, to-do to lists are basically cheat, uh, cheat sheets for, for um, bad working memory, uh, for, for memory problems, and just to make sure that you're doing things and keeping to task as well. So managing space and materials. Um, create a dedicated workspace. And we all, every student here has a desk to work on in their bedroom, um, their own space. And we help doing executive function to organize that space. And the academic staff help to organize the notebooks and the book bags that uh, the students bring back to, to, to uh, the room each night. Uh, organize workspace, the color coded bands, um, sections and backpack especially. A lot of students first semester, or first term here, they open their, their backpack and just crumpled a piece of paper, assignments that were due a month ago at the bottom, and, and things like that. Um, minimize clutter. We, during executive functioning, I used to work a lot with students to just go through the paper. And I know a lot of, um, a lot of staff I work with need to do this too. And they just need to go through, uh, throw things away, get rid of the clutter, organize the things they have. Uh, schedule cleaning and organizing at least once per week, which is, which is great to do. We do have a deep cleaning night here at CIP. And it's a good time to make sure all those tasks that need to get done on a weekly basis you have time to get done. So they're actually on a schedule and uh, written in, I believe it was uh, light blue. Um, and then employ the master notebook system, which we do for academic executive functioning. According, using according files or three ring files and sections. Organizing by class, uh, by due date maybe. Really however, um, what works best for the student especially. Can you put it back for a second? Um, <coughs> right, so, and you can also put on your calendar, like your Google Calendar or whatever, like Friday afternoon for an hour before you leave work, organizing your office. Just pick up and put things away, generally put things in the right piles, and then and do that. When I travel, one of the benefits of traveling is that I take the junk with me that I have to go through, and I try to clean up and organize and get everything done before I leave. I have a clean slate when I come back. It's like you don't want to leave your house a mess, so you want to clean. I usually clean the house before you leave, so you come back to a clean house. It's that like same kind of thing. And then you also can put on there, like yesterday I put on, I have a bill that just comes every three months, and so I put it on my calendar. I always remember, forget to pay this company, and they always have to get a hold of me, there's a penalty if you don't pay it on time. So I put it on my calendar for the year, the, the four payments, so that I pay them on time. And then I usually just pay the bills as soon as I get them. I just pay them all, and I pay them ahead, so that 
uh, I pay my bills I, all at once. If I have insurance for the year, I pay it all at once. So it helps me because if I forget to pay it monthly or something, then it's a pain in the butt because I have to, it adds another task I have to do every month. I'd rather just pay it for the year if, it, if you can do that. I mean, so that's what I do. So really what we're saying is you want to make sure in your calendar you schedule things that help you stay organized and on task. And um, we have a little bit more here. We're not going to take a break, but I do want to have a little state change because I think everyone's getting a little restless in your seat. So just stand up for a minute. And let's just do a little wiggling around and jumping up and down. Come on, let's see some real jumping up. Up and down, up and down. Come on, let's get the black going. Okay. All right, that's it. So it's just to get refreshed. All right, what I want to talk about is um, the taking a picture of the things that you might be likely to forget before you leave your apartment. Can you push that to the next one? How many of you have had success by using pictures? Uh, to help you remember things. Do any of you do that? You put a picture by your doors before you go out? Yeah. Um, I'm so visual, so if I have something like that, I'm more likely to notice it than words. And for some reason, it seems to be only the, um, like the phone, all the great phones we have and the Macs that have all these visual icons, like a little book or a little person doing exercise. But in the rest of life, we, everything's always words. So I think for those of us who are visual, it's great if we have these little pictures because um, they help us to remember things. Just wanted to say when I was hiking in the Grand Canyon of Australia, I had to remember which exit to get off the trail, and they all looked the same in the woods. So there was a sign that said the name of the little trailhead, and I just took my iPhone out and took a picture of it so I'd remember when I got back around the loop, which one to get off where my car was. So I could have went by and got lost. So a little, the iPhones are great like that. Also, when I travel, if I see a creperie, I take a picture of the menu with my iPhone and I send it to Emmy so she has ideas about things. And there's a, you can use your iPhone for a lot of things like that to organize yourself. What you I'm sorry. So academics. So we talked a little bit about the master notebook system. I won't go into that more. These are just other memory systems like the SQ3R. I don't know if you know what that is. It's like a note-taking system. Um, we talked about visual note-taking. You can use flashcards, tape-recorded lectures, the LiveScribe pen, which is a little pen that records a lecture. But and then when you go, you write your notes at the same time. And then if, let's say, you write down uh, the word um, Australia or something, the professor was talking about it, if you say the word Australia to the pen, it'll go back to the section of the lecture where he's talking about Australia, and it'll repeat it back to you. And so you can go over your, your notes with it, and also um, it's, a, it's a, just another system of being organized with it. Kate is one of our big users. You Use it. Yeah. Help show up. Yeah. Okay. And audio books, we've used book, um, you know, books for the blind. We've used that for 15 years, 18 years here. Our uh, Markham and Kindle notebooks and e-readers are helpful too. Go on. I guess. What is this bookends? Yeah. So bookends is. Um, is our executive functioning skills groups. And what we do is bring the students into small groups, and we um, we use these nice posters about executive skills behind them with an instructor, like in a horseshoe, and then they meet usually on Monday and Friday. And what they do is they it's like a sort of AA for executive functioning. They talk about each student talks about what they did over the weekend, what they worked on their project their employment, their executive functioning in their apartment, and their strategies they use that they were implementing, and, and then they go through and they learn a lot from each other. Uh, and then they talk about what they're going to do from Monday to Friday, and their plan for the week. And then they go on Friday and they do the same thing. What did you get accomplished? 
What are you planning for the weekend? What's your plan to get your paper done over the weekend? You know, what's your strategy and how are you going to do it? So um, it's, it's really helpful for me. I need like the donkey rule. So if I had four other students or five other students in there and I heard that Jill was doing her paper this way and Matt was doing it that way and John was doing it that way, I, I probably would have not thought of any of those things and I would have thought, gee, I, maybe I should make an outline. You know, I never made an outline for a paper. So I would have learned a lot just by osmosis, by listening to them. Okay, it's cool. Who is this? It's you. So re residential interventions for executive function difficulties. Um, some of the things we, we utilize uh, in residential are the EF checklist, uh, posted on veteran doors, and those checklists can be everything from hygiene checklists, which I think will be a picture of, it, as far as um, bedroom cleaning checklists, planning ahead, making sure you're prepared the night before. One student I worked with in particular was very nervous about before he went to bed every night to make sure he was prepared for the next day. So a checklist was actually made, um, make sure that you do all your hygiene and then you have your clothes laid out, your backpack all set, all your homework is, is done and in your backpack. So in the morning you wake up, get a shower, get dressed, grab your backpack and go. You don't have to worry about um, all the remembering to do everything morning and forgetting something on your way at the door. Um, photos, and, along with uh, the checklist of uh, how to clean your bedroom, really breaking that, that large task into, into chunks like we were talking about before. Um, we have photos of, like be, the before photo I should be, we showed, if you guys remember, uh, the really, the really uh, dirty room. And then you have, you can go back. You can go back. And then you have, uh, Sorry. And then you have what the, the acceptably clean bat, uh, bathroom, kitchen, bedroom should look like. So a student can actually make a checklist based off how to get to to make your room look like that photo. Um, and photos that will properly group students look like post, uh, posted in, in your apartment by the mirror on the front door on your way out. You can check in to make sure that you're, you're good to go. And uh, we also utilize labels for, for drawers. I've worked with some students that, that actually even might be here today. That um, I open the I open a drawer and they have jeans, underwear, socks, and some T-shirts all stuffed in, not folded, uh, just in the top drawer. And then the couple other drawers are, are, are totally empty. So really utilizing your space, uh, and it's a good way to just organize, keep things folded, and so you appear for as well. And here's an example of that the, the a checklist. So every morning, the student would basically check, check these off on Monday through Friday, uh, school days, or uh, days they could come up to, uh, to, to the program setting. Uh, make sure you shower, clean clothes, deodorant, check hair in the mirror, it's sticking up. Eat breakfast and brush teeth, and then you're out the door. And then with this, you can come up with a point system. And it's work, it doesn't work with a lot, all of our students, but some who are very visual learners. We create this, this point system, and then we actually graph the graphic progress over the course of the semester. And that visual representation of progress is really, really helpful for our students. And because it's such a slow process for a lot, it, it's like you, you might not think you're making progress, but based on this graph, you're going up every single every single week. You're doing so much better on your own, independently, making sure everything is checked off and that you're you're good to go before you, you leave in the morning. All right, so if you remember the photo, before, this is after. And there she is smiling. <laughs> so, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, about looking at the big picture. So this girl saw that, that bedroom, and it was probably like that back home too. Looking at that big picture, totally overwhelming. Where do I start? How do I get from point A, the before picture, to this? How do I do that? So we break, it, we break the test down. Um, into smaller chunks. Well, in order to get your, your bedroom look like this, we take a picture of what it should look like, and then A, maybe you get all your dirty clothes into the laundry basket. B, you, you vacuum or get all the garbage or get all the dishes out or, or something, get all your, your, your books and papers and your desk neatly organized. So you're really breaking that large, overwhelming task into smaller, much manageable tasks. So I wanted to say about that, I had a, um, a brother who was depressed, his wife died, and he had this big house full of art and furniture and everything, and he was really depressed about her dying, and he just didn't even know where to start. 
And so what, this is what a strategy I gave him. I said, I want you to give away one item a day. I want you to clean up one area a day, one small section a day, and I want you to, you know, organize for your sale some a couple of things every day, just a few things every day. And that's what I want, and get rid of some junk in the trash every day. Like three or four things he had to do every day. I said, in a month, you'll feel so much better. And so I went out there like three or four times during the year to help him, and he had big, you know, sales and everything, and organized, he had lots of art and everything else. And, um, and sometimes you have to sort of help people, so I just said, he was like, well, I don't know if I would lose my house to the bank, you know, whatever. And I said, well, did you call anyone? I said, Jim, did you know when I was out driving that a block away from your house is a, is a counseling credit, you know, counseling office for people who have this problem? So I said, watch. And I picked up the phone and I called the lady and I said, just listen. So, and I said to her, because he was afraid, he said, if they know what I'm doing, will they report it to the bank and I won't, well, you know, maybe they said, no, they're not, it's, everything's confidential, I'll ask her all the questions, you watch. So I asked her all the questions that he was afraid to take action on, and she answered them all, and I said, this is what you need to do. So go get the application today and start doing it. And so it took about three or four months, but after he got all that stuff done, he's remarried a year later, happy traveling all over and the whole thing. But it was a problem. My daughter went through a divorce, had this house that was a mess, this big house she gotten a divorce, I said, do one thing every day to improve your house. Clean up an area, fix something up, put a picture up here, do something every day. By the end of the month, your house will look so much better and you won't be feeling so overwhelmed with it. So doing the little things is really important. So clinical intervention is to reconcile the discrepancy between giftedness and differences. A lot of our students are so smart that but they're so dysfunctional that they don't get it. They've been told they're so smart that they feel that there's something hugely wrong with them and they get depressed about it because they can't do some of these simple organizational things for themselves. And they, you know, people will tell them you're so smart and they think, well, how come I can't do this? And they get depressed about it. So the discrepancy between giftedness and differences and help them to understand the complex emotions around that, that everyone's different just because you're dysfunctional. Well, we've had the smartest, the smartest kids in our program be the most dysfunctional in their apartments or the other way around. So one of the kids I ran into in Indiana, when I was out there at our session, Lori, I asked this kid, and this kid was a really smart kid who thought the other kids in the program were below him and I shouldn't be with these retards. That's what he said to me a couple years ago. And I said to him, how come you're doing so well now? How come you came, how did you get over this problem? Because I had counseled them a few times when they asked me to, when I was out there. He said, I realized that they can do, they're organized, and they can do all these things that I can't do. Even though I'm smart, I can't organize for my classes. I can't organize in my apartment. They have all these other abilities they don't have. So he just started to accept them, on, that they're good at things that he's not good at, and he's good at other things. And he got by assisting goal planning and clinical, monitor pharmacological. There is a role for meds and it can help you be more organized if you, have, if, if you haven't done all the other things. If you're not doing sensory exercises and if you're not eating right, if you're not doing all the other stuff, then meds will help you. I say you can probably in most cases get rid of a lot of the meds if you do the other things. But if you can't, then meds will help you organize yourself. And some people need them even if they're doing the exercise and everything else too. Teach uh, breathing exercises, teach techniques for overcoming anxiety, which is pretty much comorbid with everyone on the spectrum. The anxiety, right? That's a big problem because you can't function. If, you, if you're anxious, are you able to really be in the moment and think of what you should do next? It goes right by you. It's cool. And it's the continuum of growth. Self-awareness and self-understanding should be in the middle there. So you first you're aware that you're different, then you understand who you are, then you can get to start self-regulating. Like I, I missed regulating one of my things tonight, but that's whatever it is. I'm usually better than that, but 
and then you can self-advocate, and I'm sort of at the level where I can self-determine. That means I get to start an art gallery, I get to do all these cool things because I'm organized in all the other ways and take care of myself in most of those other ways. Then you get to be able to do the higher order things in your life. Like the students we're talking to, Matt Curtis, who's a lifeguard down in Berkshire South, and uh, you know students uh, in Boston who are working managing a Petco store, you know, and they're doing all kinds of stuff that they couldn't do when they were here. That's the end. And we're going to have some time for a couple questions, because I know it's, it's about an hour, and just ask some questions. So let's start with that. No, I was going to, if you want, can you go back to the last slide there? Uh, some, of, some of these are great. These are uh, time management tools and a flying alarm clock. And I don't think any of our students here have used them, but basically in the morning when your alarm goes off, it takes off like a little helicopter across the other side of the room. So you actually have to go looking for it in order to get up and getting that blood circulating. I actually just heard about recently, it's a um, alarm clock mat. So it, it's a mat that will continuously beep until your full weight is on it for I think for at least a minute. So that means you're, you're up standing for at least a minute before We're it turns off. Sorry. <laughs> 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 um, but these, these are just some, some things you can use for exactly a bunch of difficulties, kind of helping. And, and everything from those to a to-do list is really an exact function tool. I have, one more. I have one more that I want to add as well. Has anyone used a standing desk? Do you know what that is? Okay. Well, if you, the way you can try it out is if you happen to have a dresser in your house or almost like a table that's like a... You know, sometimes if you're at a restaurant that has a high table, it's kind of like in the cocktail area. And if you're standing and working on your computer, some of us work better. Like I do great standing working on a computer. And you're burning more calories, which is always great. You can wiggle around. When you get tired, you just sit down back at the desk. And it's a great way to, um, sometimes your, some people's brains work better standing. So you don't have, these standing desks are quite expensive. You can be creative and like I do, I use my dresser uh, a lot of the time and then I sit down when I get tired of standing. Questions? 